Bushnell borrows big to build. Tengen trounced in Tetris tussle, and Pokemon perceived to push to pupils. These stories and many more that aren't alliterations on this month's episode of the Video Game Newsroom Time Machine. I've been waiting a long time for a chance to say this. Stop the presses. Requiescat in pace. What is a man? It's me, Mario. Please save me. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of the Video Game Newsroom Time Machine. As always, I'm your host, Carl, and my co-host, Peter. Say hi, Peter. Hi. I don't know why that's funny. It's not really funny, but it still makes me smile and laugh every time. I don't know why. Yeah. Go figure. It's okay. a nice thing. Yes. So, as always, we will be looking back this month at the biggest stories in and around the video game industry in December of 1979, 1989, and 1999. And, uh, yeah, we are recording this a little early, which is not normal for us because we're not normally recording all. late. Not at all. This is the 13th of November, so in case there's any late-breaking news between now and when you this comes out in December, that is due to the fact that... Uh, we weren't sure how much time we were going to get because I may or may not, by the time this comes out, already be a father. So I hope you may. You will. Not necessarily. The due date's the 13th of December, so if it comes a little earlier, comes a little later, we're not quite sure. Uh, all I can tell you is I have not started a wildfire or crashed an airplane in a gender reveal party. Yay! Because we didn't do anything that stupid. Hmm. So, uh, yeah. And that's enough personal news. Let's get started with the time jump. And we go back to n December of 1979. You will say November more than once. Probably. Yeah. So, what's our first story? Yes. Without any time traveling sounds, Pizza Time Theater gets a big loan. Pizza Time Theater, home of Chuck E. Cheese, has announced that they got a $2 million loan to help them expand. They currently operate six restaurants slash gaming center hybrid locations and say they expect that corporate sales to exceed $20 million in 1980 from just three million dollars in 1979. The loan will be used to open more company-owned stores but they will also expand via franchising with two new locations opening per month through 1980. Organic growth, always good. Always a good thing. <laughs> it, it, I mean at this point in time with the video game boom, the arcade boom really taking off, uh, this Seems like a perfectly reasonable thing to do. 700% growth. <laughs> this is the most yes. reasonable thing to do. Go big or go home. This is Nolan Bushnell's baby, okay? The man who basically launches the video game industry as we know it. Mm. He's not going to do this slowly and wait for other people to move in on his turf. I mean, uh, last month we talked about how he brought Joe Keenan in from Key Games, the Atari yep. subsidiary. Feels like it was just last week. Uh, it, it Imagine that. Yes, <laughs> it kind of was. Uh, and Keenan talks about how the company spent $2.5 million prior to opening their first test store two years earlier to develop their animatronic characters that the sh store was known for. And so this $2 million sounds like a lot, but we are talking no, about doesn't. a relatively large investment. I mean, in $1979, surely it was a it, whole you lot got of at money, least but... triple or almost quadruple it in certain yeah. regards. But, but still, it's, it's not still not a, not a lot. But remember that they have to build these locations, but they're just putting them in strip malls and similar mm -hmm. things. I mean, they're not building the location no. typically. So they were renting out the places. Uh, for the most yeah. part, or what is also very common in this kind of location, because the Chuck E. Cheese would almost become a anchor store. Mm -hmm. So it would be a larger location surrounded by smaller stores that would all share one large parking lot. That's the concept of a strip yeah. mall. And what would normally happen is that the owner of the strip mall might even build the location to spec. So Chuck E. Cheese would say, we need 
this location, this design. Mm -hmm. They would build it with some kind of long-term uh, rental contract or lease contract. And then the uh, owner of the land would just amortize that over time. Okay. So obviously they didn't go home because they are still existing today. -ish. Well, they still exist. I mean, when we get to 1984, we're going to talk about some problems that do yeah. arise. We talked last month how Joe Keenan stayed on as the president of Pizza Time Theater until they the filed neighbor. into mm -hmm. they filed bankruptcy and went into uh, got into some trouble by 1984. But that's okay. also part of the arcade crash as mm. well as some other financial problems and overexpansion of the company. But it, they do get bought up by one of their rivals later on, and the rival then takes the Chuck E. Cheese name, which was a much better name. Had Well, they spent so much money on advertising and on building up the brand that they just adopted uh, the Chuck E. Cheese brand for all locations. Okay. And it still survives to this day as a fairly successful... Uh, brand, even though it's had to completely reinvent itself from the form it has here in 79. And do you know whether or not they achieved the goal of a $20 million revenue? I honestly don't know. I'm hoping that as we go through the uh, next 12 months, we will get some revenue numbers mm -hmm. from them. But I haven't looked up any of their annual reports yet mm -hmm. to be able to cross-reference that. Um, I'm guessing because of the absolute uh, unavoidability of Chuck E. Cheese's when I was a kid yeah. in 1980, 81, 82, I probably first saw Chuck E. Cheese, I'm guessing around 82, uh, was when I went to one. I was probably about five or six. Yeah. And they were ubiquitous. They, they were literally everywhere, advertisement for them on television constantly. It was a big operation. And I can't imagine that they were not pulling in revenue of at least twenty million at that point. Hmm. Okay. So yeah, fun stuff. But speaking of the arcades, yes, the AMOA show reviews are in. So last month we talked about the previews for the AMOA and some of the machines that the magazines were expecting to be big hits. Well. Let's check out the actual results from the show. Replay Magazine has crowned Sega's Monaco GP to be the hit of the show. The massive sit-down cabinet was top in show at the AMOA, IAAPA, and the JAA shows. Those are they three like different that. shows for the arcade industry. Now, other highlights included Fire One, Asteroids, a full-color cocktail cab version of Space Invaders, as well as Space Invaders Deluxe, both licensed by Midway from Namco. Now, Midway has also licensed Galaxian from Namco, while Namco will be selling Space Chaser directly by way of their new U.S. product uh, production facility. Hmm. So what we're really seeing here is there's a lot of clones of the same stuff, but we're already seeing that this idea of the Space Invader clone, which at this time in Japan is really dominating the market, is not really as dominant a presence in the American market. They're really pushing for better tech, and especially important here is that both Galaxian and Monaco GP. Mm -hmm. Monaco GP, huge, huge hit in Japan, not such a big hit in the United States. Both of these games are full color. And Space Invaders okay. wasn't a full color machine yet. Remember, color screen was going to cost you some money. It's going to put a more taxing load on your video hardware. Yeah. And so color is here. Color is coming. It is going to change the game. And when we go to next year, there's virtually no black and white games left on the market. Hmm. The next year, by the time we get to 1980, when we get things like uh, Galaga, when we get Pac-Man and so forth, everything's color all the time. Video games look cool. Ish. So, <laughs> hey, 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 Pac-Man was amazing. Yeah. It's just interesting to see how uh, quickly those changes were made. You know, one year... Color is nice to have. The year before, no one talks about color. And the year thereafter, everything is color. Well, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, technology moves fast at this point. 
We are really talking about sea changes in the industry and the arcade does something that the home computer can't. Yeah. Namely, in the home computer, you buy the machine, it's gonna be years before you buy another machine. Yeah. But in the arcades, every few weeks, I'm expecting to see something new. Hmm. And you have to be more spectacular in the last thing. And it really does create an almost arms race mentality hmm. amongst the producers. So for an arcade owner, it was like this. Um, you ordered a new arcade machine. This entire entire machine with the box and the cardboard and what's around it gets shipped to you, I guess. And then you ship the old ones back. No, uh, you don't. Or how does it work? You don't. Remember, we talked about this with the founding of Key Games. Yeah. You have the regional distributors. So the individual arcade owner is going to do one of two things. The arcade owner can either decide to buy the cabinet from the local distributor, yeah. which usually means that the distributor has either purchased the standalone cabinet in full form or bought a kit that they put together in their warehouse. So the arcade owner is not the one putting this together. Yeah. The <laughs> other one is that you have uh, local companies, sometimes just mom and pop shop, you know, one, two people. Mm -hmm. And what they'll have is a run they'll have a uh, a list of places where they set up cabinets and they will either share the revenue or pay to have the cabinet placed there and get to okay. keep the revenue from the machine and so a lot of these local mm -hmm. operators uh, will then once a week run around and decide okay this this machine's been in this location for three weeks. Now we'll move it someplace else. They might have a big arcade that they supply, and they'll be moving arcade machines into that arcade and keeping them there. So that's where the newest machines will end up. Mm -hmm. And then they'll also have a couple spots on their run that might be a supermarket or a convenience store, and they'll set up machines that are a little bit older in those locations mm -hmm. because it would be a waste to put the big money-making machine that's new in right. a different location. And uh, when I was working at an arcade, Seattle Funplex, uh, for those in the Seattle area and have memories of the 80s and 90s and going to Funplex, I was for a brief while the guy cooking your meal in the back room. Uh, confidence inspiring or not, that may be. But I remember <laughs> having a conversation with the guy who supplied some of the machines to the arcade. So we had a handful of older cabinets that belonged to the arcade. Okay. And then we had all the new cabinets were actually owned by one of these operators. So he would come in, he'd uh, place the machine down, and if the machine was doing well, he'd leave it there. If the machine started dropping, he'd switch it out, and so on and so forth. And so when I talked to him a little bit about the mechanics and mm -hmm. the economics of this, it was basically he also supplied uh, arcade cabinets to local Safeway grocery stores. He mm -hmm. supplied them to convenience stores. He supplied them to a bunch of different arcades around town. And he would just move them around this way mm -hmm. until they didn't make any money. Then he might switch out the boards and try to do something else with it. Or he would sell them off to collectors. Hmm. So it was a real – there's there's a business behind this. And it's a model that predates video games. Yeah. It's a model that already existed for pinball, that existed for whack-a-mole, that existed for uh, skeet shooting games, mm -hmm. for electromechanical, for jukeboxes. It's the same model for everything, really. Um, yeah, it really sounds like the uh, the model of an, um, how do you call them, slot machine. Uh, slot machines, yes. Uh, but again, slot machines are so heavily regulated in the U.S., yeah. Now, in Germany, yes, this would be the model for a slot machine. But in the U.S., this would be, uh, that's kind of restricted to maybe Las Vegas and a couple of other places. Oh, right, you can't have a slot exactly. machine just everywhere. Here have you have it like machine. in uh, the, any other gas station. Yeah, exactly. Here you've got them in every uh, little food joint. You've got them in every mm. gas station. They're everywhere. But in the States, the same thing was with video games. Although yeah. they have a shady image. I have to say that. The consoles or the arcade games? Both. Of slot course. machines. <laughs> well, the slot machines obviously do because there's yeah. the vice factor of gambling. Oh, yeah. And, well, we'll talk more about gambling later in the show, but we're not quite there yet. 
What else right. did we learn about from the JAMA show? Yes, uh, Sega standardizes their arcade boards. Oh, Way before sense. the JAMA standard, Sega tried to make cabinets with interchangeable PCBs. Now, these came in two formats, the Dual and the Mini Video Cabinet. Now, Dual could hold two separate games, while the Mini Video, which has a very compact size and was originally designed for use on Navy vessels, can hold up to four games. The standard didn't seem to catch on, and only six games seem to have appeared on the system. Yeah, I mean, it makes totally sense to have a standardized set. And, and it's funny because uh, when I was looking, doing research for the episode, in the 1989, the December 89 issue mm. of Replay Magazine, uh, and it's the 15th anniversary of the yeah. magazine, they have a retrospective, and there's a picture of Dave Rosen, the original founder of Sega. Mm. And the tagline underneath him is that he was a uh, forerunner a proponent of the interchangeable PCB, yeah. of the interchangeable game. And this is really where you see that. Yeah. This foundational bit where they're saying, hey, you know, you've got the screen and everything. Why are we switching this out? Why bother with this? And so the idea of this multi-game cabinet at the time doesn't seem to uh, take off. And I actually had a discussion with one of our fellow video game historians, Ethan of the history of how we play, link in the show notes below. And he said, yeah, um, he's big, big uh, source for information on Gremlin, which was the, at this point, Sega subsidiary in the United States. They had been bought out by Sega a little bit before this. <clears throat> and it, it didn't seem to have worked out for them. But it really is a system that is seeing the future coming. It, they know they've got to make more out of this cabinet. There's more mm. to it than this. So before the standardization, every cabinet maker had their own set of you know, connections. And every cabinet was different from the one before. Pretty much, yeah. But you also have to remember this. A lot of the cabinets before this, I mm. mean, the idea of using CPUs, standard yeah. CPUs, is still relatively new. Okay. And the way that you're going to create a video hardware that outputs a signal the TV can answer mm. is also not standardized because the moment you make it standardized, mm. you have to have extra components you may not need. So yeah. at this point, you're trying to pare it down to keep the cost low to just what you need for this game. Well, but then you have to develop everything new over and over again. Exactly. So your R&D costs are way higher. Your R&D costs are way higher, but at this point, chips are so expensive that okay. man hours That's are cheaper. This, this is obviously changing. Almost all the games that we talked about on the AMOA here, actually mm -hmm. all of them, are chip-based games. Yeah. That era is over. Now... The creation of the JAMA standard, this mm -hmm. standard harness that you can plug right in. It doesn't matter what your PCB is. The monitor is standard. The plug-in is standard. The controller mm -hmm. ad adapter is standard. That's still a few years off into the future. I believe 84, 85. Mm -hmm. But this attempt to do it within the company is already an interesting first step. Yeah. yeah. And once the Japanese arcade industry decides on a standard, all bets are off. It's just, okay, that's going to be the standard. That's the hookup. We're done. Sure. And it really does help the industry in the long run. And it's just interesting to see that sort of coming now. I mean, also the, the guys manufacturing the chips and the, the cables and whatnot, they can focus on just producing what the standard is demanding, right? So you have those costs <clears throat> going down. Well, also, it means that smaller companies will be able to make games yeah. because they don't have to have a giant factory building a cabinet. They exactly. just have to have a factory putting together the motherboard. Right. But that simplicity is basically also going to be a source of a problem. And one of the ads in uh, Play Meter magazine gives us a hint of that. Yes. The Space Invaders modification boards are out. One of the first modification boards to increase the difficulty of existing games is advertised in Play Meter magazine. 
this mod board increases the challenge of existing Space Invader games. So how can I picture this? You plug in this board into your arcade cabinet and then uh, the, the enemies move differently or? <clears throat> Basically just think of it, and I'm oversimplifying here, and there were a couple, of, there was a lot of different boards like this at the time. Yeah. But what you're really doing is you're just overclocking the CPU. Okay. <clears throat> now, are these modification boards do get more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And probably the most famous of these modification boards is the modification for Pac-Man that ends up changing mm -hmm. the game and making it so much better mm -hmm. that it just gets licensed by Midway mm -hmm. and turned into Miss Pac-Man. Okay. So Miss Pac-Man actually starts out as a modification board for Pac-Man by some college kids. So, but then it's changing the entire level and not just the, the movement speed or... Well, and that's the thing. This first wave of modification yeah. boards is really just accelerating the speed. Okay. So imagine you've got a player who can come in, he's been playing Space Invaders long enough, he puts in one quarter, and he's going to be sitting on the machine for the next 30 minutes. Yeah. That's a nightmare for the operator. Exactly. So what do you do? You add the modification <laughs> board, the thing is much faster. He's going to get to the speed. The difficulty of the mm -hmm. game at this point is the speed. He's going to get to that faster speed much faster, mm -hmm. and he's going to die much sooner. Sure. Now, in addition to that, now he has to put the quarter in sooner, but it also is, for the user, a massive improvement because if it takes me 30 minutes before the game becomes challenging, I may not play it anymore. Yeah. But if I know, ooh, they got the faster version, I'm going to come out and play that, then that changes things. So then you would have a Space Invaders normal version and a Spiced Up Space Invaders version. Two different cabinets. You can't just like change. Uh, no, no, you're just adding. Play. Well, no. Uh, the arcade operator adds it to the existing board. Okay, the board so itself it's isn't replicating the whole game. It's just one little add-on to the board. Right, but but then it's set. You can just then select it's a set. higher no, difficulty. No, it's... no, no, no. They're not giving you the option in the game yeah. for that. It's basically when it boots up, it looks normal. Uh, and at, surprise. At this point, they're still looking normal. Again, a lot of this stuff will completely change the games as they go forward. Uh, and these modification boards are going to become a major source of legal mm -hmm. contention. And people will sue over this, and there will be a lot of lawsuits, and we'll get to talk about them. Interesting. And foreshadowing. A little bit of foreshadowing, yes. yes. So, uh, but staying with Space Invaders. Yes, Space Invader clones hit home computers. Licenses aren't a big concern yet, apparently, as Creative Computing's in-house software publishing is selling Space Invaders and making no bones about the similarities to Taito's games. Super Invaders. Super Invaders. Not Space Invaders, man. Exactly, this one's Super Invader. And this one, <laughs> curiously enough, has programmed was programmed by an M. Hata from Japan and was released under several other names over the years. Now... This Super Invader game uh, actually is hugely, hugely popular, hugely in influential. It's released for the Apple, mm -hmm. and it really does in many ways help launch the gaming industry really? for home computers. Yes. I mean, it's basically the same like Space Invaders. It's basically Space Invaders, yeah. I mean, there's a few small differences, but it's basically Space Invaders. So why don't you just take Space Invaders? Because Space Invaders doesn't exist for the Apple. So why didn't those guys make Space Invaders for the Apple? Because licensing games for home computers mm. isn't really a thing yet. Nobody's oh, okay. really thought of doing it. Plus, the idea of what is a copyright on a game mm -hmm. hasn't really been decided either yet. Uh, there's going to be a landmark case mm. uh, in a little bit where we're going to decide what elements are necessary for a game to be copyrightable. And these issues we will persist all the way through the 80s. We yeah. talked about in 1989 yeah. with International Karate versus Karate Champ. Yeah. And exactly those problems of, well, how many elements from a game can I copy before it's I'm copy. violating copyright? <laughs> 
Uh, we're going to see it also again once we get to the Pac-Man games. Atari becomes very litigious about its exclusive right to do home versions of Pac-Man. Yeah. Uh, to the point where Sierra gets sued and a bunch of people get sued for doing muncher games. Hmm. And so this idea of what is a copyrightable idea in the video game space is very, very difficult to do because, let's oh, yeah. face it, it's not like film. There's not a specific sequence is a sequence of images yeah. that will always happen the same way, which is what traditional copyright uh, protects. Every game is different. Sure. Every time you put in a quarter and you move the joystick in a different uh, direction, the number of possible combinations of images on the screen is almost infinite. Ish, yeah. Yeah. And so this is why we have to be very, very careful here when we're talking about, well, why didn't they ju just do it? Because nobody had thought of it yet. And Well, it makes sense, yeah. And it, it's coming, though. Oh, is it coming? Mm -hmm. So, and staying on computers. And things that are coming, the computer shopper, I'm butchering, I'm going to butcher this word, debuts? No, debuts. debuts. The T is silent. Ah, debuts. The computer shopper. Debuts. A mainstay of home computing first. Uh, okay, now it's my turn. Now it's going to cut yeah. out. Be cut out, yeah. <laughs> no, it's not. I'm going to leave it in. No, I'm not. Oh, if you heard that, I did. Lazy. Okay, a mainstay of home computing's first two decades. The Computer Shopper magazine gets its first major ads this month. The computer shopper would ultimately bulge into an 800-page phone book-style nationwide classifieds publication with ads and articles about every conceivable system on the market. So was it a monthly or a yearly? I believe it was a monthly publication. 800 pages. The thing was just massive. It was like a telephone book. So what did they talk about on 800 pages Well, it, every most month? of it was ads. Oh. It was basically... <laughs> Um, small ads. It was your local computer store in the day and age before the internet. You needed a piece of hardware. <clears throat> this this is the way you found a local, uh, not a local. This is how you found a supplier, a local supplier, whoever. You would go to your section of the book and find it. So was it then like, so those are the Seattle pages and, uh, you know. If I remember correctly, and it, it didn't really bother with computer shopper very often yeah. uh seattle had its own little local version of mm -hmm. this that i would buy almost every week just to see you know what new games had come out or who was doing a sale or whatever else was happening yeah uh but you no know, computer shopper was something you, it was ubiquitous in all the magazine shops bookstores mm -hmm. and so forth and they also had articles you know reviews of the latest stuff coming out or whatever okay yeah, so it was. This is where it gets started. There's a big ad for it um, in uh, the magazines this month, especially Byte Magazine has a big one-page ad saying, "Hey, people, we're doing this. You know, send us your ads, you know, and stuff, and be a part of Computer Shopper." So the Computer Shopper, a uh, computer magazine, more or less, had an ad in another magazine. Were they like? Well, Byte one Magazine company? didn't do that much in the way of classified ads it so was more articles and so forth. yeah and this was basically just supposed to be this big massive guide where if you wanted to sell a computer you put an ad in the computer shop so there were no competitors no real competitors at this time because remember it's still a fledgling market yeah you don't have the mass market computer yet okay. you don't have the computers being sold in every store although we did talk about how the wish book this mm. year has the Atari 400 in it. Hmm. It's the start of that mass distribution of machines. It's hmm. coming. It's on the horizon. The computer shopper is going to be ready for it. So, yeah. Do they still publish this phone book? I believe not. I, I honestly don't think it's still hmm. being published, <clears throat> but I'd have to look that up again. I mean, the internet killed a whole lot of them, so and, exactly, why not the Exactly. I mean, there was really no point to it once uh, the internet came along. But, you know, mm. it was a mainstay there for a good 20 years. Right. Yeah. And nowadays that you have like five ads in front of every YouTube video, 
why pay money for a book to look at more ads? Exactly. Craigslist, baby. Craigslist. <laughs> All right, moving on. IBM microcomputer rumors promise a revolution. The rumor is that IBM will, will, will release their microcomputer by December of 1979, and it will use a simple keyboard and a plasma display, costing $4,000 for the low-end system, with plans to move to LCD displays later. They're also thinking of launching 200 retail stores and getting the price of their basic system down to just $1,000 by 1981. This is the uttermost expensive. Uh, extremely expensive. And I mean, plasma TV, uh, plasma monitor in 1980 would have been outrageous. Yeah. Of course, the IBM compatible wouldn't hit the market until 1981. It used a traditional tube-style monitor and cost about $1,500 and used very much off-the-shelf components, uh, making it also the easy-to-clone machine yeah. that it had become. So sure, what we're dealing with here is a wild, wild rumor, but an important one just for the fact that we mm. had rumors about a year ago of Texas Instruments entering the market and everybody was like, holy crap, nobody will survive Texas Instruments entering. And now the new boogeyman for all the companies is IBM entering mm -hmm. the market. You know, I think it's really interesting that right before a console, a new computer or whatnot launches, that there are so many rumors about what this thing, this magical thing is going to be able to do and you know why right now the ps5 and the xbox scarlet are more or less in front of the doors and everyone's rumoring hey they can do this and that and that and then two weeks later it's like no this was just a rumor they can do this and this and this and then and it all doesn't make sense you know well <laughs> it, it just doesn't it makes, make sense it makes sense because you have to remember we are dealing mm -hmm. with geeks we're yeah, dealing sure. with people who are totally get excited about this stuff yeah, yeah as totally. they should be and the idea of figuring out what's going on and this isn't going to be part of our notes but in the 99 jump mm. next generation magazine actually has a whole article about some offhand comment ken kutaragi the designer of the playstation and playstation 2 yeah. made about potentially what the playstation 3 will be remember this is still months and months and months before the PlayStation 2 comes out. And they they spent a page and a half just speculating on this because it was exciting. I remember reading the article at the time and being like, wow, a thousand times more powerful than this already <laughs> amazing machine. And what does it machines. tell you? Basically nothing. <laughs> it doesn't tell you jack. But what it means is that in a, in a field of technology that moves as quickly as computer technology does. Yeah, it's a just lot fun to talk of, about it. A lot of speculation, suddenly, it, you might speculate about something, mm -hmm. and the reality will be much, much better than what you ever speculated about. Sometimes people will promise something on a machine, and when you finally see it, you're just like, well, that's even better than what I thought. <laughs> well, this is not at all what I've and been talked about. <laughs> exactly. and Or then you see suddenly somebody do something with a system that you never thought was possible on that system. When the original PlayStation launched, if you mm. had told somebody you were going to be able to pull off a game like Dino Crisis or Metal Gear Solid on it with fully 3D movable worlds where you see the character from the outside and stuff at a time when doom was a first person game because they didn't have enough processing power to make it third person oh yeah sure it it would have blown your mind and the first games on the playstation jumping jack flash and wipeout and so forth mm. had a lot of pop in or were first person because they had such a hard time with that third person with yeah. generating an extra character on screen. And to suddenly then see the same hardware do that, you're just like, wow. And so this idea of the speculation of what could we still do with this machine that the original designers haven't even thought of yet or push bounds that were not supposed to be pushed. 
is exciting. It gets your blood boiling. It gets the adrenaline pumping. And that's why I love being a geek. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that concludes our jump to 1979. Let's turn on the time machine and head over to December of 1989. Ooh. Okay. Dude, copyright infringement. <laughs> <laughs> it was short enough. They can't prove it. Okay, so... Welcome to December of 1989. What's our first story as the decade comes to an end? <laughs> and the week passed since we recorded 1979. <laughs> Shh. They don't know this. They weren't there. Okay. <laughs> you weren't there. <laughs> Anyhow, Gemma Show Jam packed with carnival games. According to Ace Magazine, the latest JAMA coin-op show in Japan was over 50% non-video game devices. Mallet-whacking games, claw machines, and the like invaded the show. The at-the-time often lamented lack of originality in the arcades, shoot-em-ups, beat-em-ups, and racing titles seem to have become the only type of game the industry was producing has finally given birth to an abandonment of video games by some. The mag speculates, though, that this might be a golden opportunity for home console and computer game makers to break out of the arcade port mania and start making some RPGs or strategy titles. Mm -hmm. And since video games in arcades were so boring and well-known, yeah, they decided to just stick to what everyone knows, claw games and the like. <laughs> well, you have to look at it more in the sense of you had a couple of very standard genres that okay. had developed, especially because the Japanese weren't doing a lot of innovation with 3D graphics at this point. Okay. And so the platforms that you're using right now in 89 are really good at pushing sprites around you've got the standard joystick and a couple of button controller yeah in the especially in what the japanese called the candy cabinets and so this idea of okay we just need to keep making the same types of game we'll make them faster we'll make them prettier but to really break out and do something innovative doesn't seem to be in the cards and because you've got so many games that are similar the manufacturers are having a hard time turning a profit on their games yeah. because they're so similar. And this is basically just trying to do something else. Have a product on the market that isn't the same. And there's also another factor I believe going on here, namely mm -hmm. with the more powerful 16-bit consoles. And remember, in Japan, they're a, at least a year earlier than everybody else. The Turbo Graphics has been around, the PC Engine's been around for a couple of years. The Genesis has already been out in Japan for over a year. The Super Nintendo is on the horizon. And I think more and more older gamers have started to migrate to the living room. Yeah. And so the <laughs> idea... They can't get out of the door anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Such horrible, horrible stereotypes. Is that really what we've been reduced to on this show that tries to strive for factual, content-driven content wow that's <laughs> content terrible driven content content driven content well no we are <laughs> <laughs> no the real problem i think here is that there is a glut in the market we need a paradigm shift yeah the paradigm mm -hmm. shift is coming capcom has introduced the cps2 board and once street fighter hits we will see a whole new way of interacting in the arcade namely the one-on-one yeah. -on -one versus fighter as opposed to the co-op beat-em-up game, that's going to be a big paradigm shift. Oh. And right now at this right. point, this hasn't hit the arcades yet. Right. No it, one has thought of people uh, fighting against each other. Well, also remember, the competing against one another, number one, wasn't really a Japanese thing. It's always about collaboration and working together, which is going to make Street Fighter II that much of a paradigm shift. And it's also just the simple fact that doing a game where two people are fighting one another requires yep. you to have a lot of moves in the game. 
Because a game like Double Dragon, for example, which is a huge success at this point in time, or had been mm. a year or so earlier, had a relatively large number of moves mm -hmm. for the character. Like you could do the whole hit the guy behind you with your elbow, a flying kick, grab a guy and pound his head against your knee, a few things like this. But even that move set, which you were just playing out nicely, which I was just playing out nicely and the people at home couldn't see, is going to pale in comparison with the move set that we are going to get in the one-on-one -on -one fighting genre. Yeah. And had you made a fighting game at this point, a one-on-one -on -one fighting game with only two buttons, with only, let's say, seven or eight moves, it wouldn't have kept anybody's attention for very long. And this is why you okay. get games like Renegade and Double Dragon and even Final Fight, which is going to come out here very soon. Those games live off of the limited uh, move set. It's only once you get your six buttons. And we had this already with Street Fighter 1 a few years before this. But Street Fighter 1 was too slow. The timing mechanism was completely off. It didn't work yet. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be the innovation of Street Fighter 2, and then also the Neo Geo fighting games, Art of Fighting and so forth, and then later King of Fighters, that you're going to get this whole new genre, but it's still out there. It's still a couple years away. And at this point, it makes sense that some of these arcade manufacturers who have long-standing experience with Electromechanical, as we've talked about previously in our 79 jumps, they're going to be like, well, you know what? Mm, we can still get make some money off of this. And claw games are still popular to this day where arcade video games have actually dropped a lot in popularity. Mm. There's something about moving that claw around and getting a prize. It's just there's, there's a reaction to that that you're <laughs> not going to get usually from a video game. So it's an interesting thing here. Uh, whether or not Ace Magazine is correct in the sense that the European developers will really move that far away from the arcade games and mm. start making new type of games is only going to be, I think, true to a limited extent. We're going to see some very, very innovative games in the next couple of years from the Europeans. Mm -hmm. uh, but the big European maker mm -hmm. manufacturers at this time, like Ocean, are going to fail that transition. They're going to do some experimental games. Yeah, uh, We're going to get Epic and RoboCop 3 and a few other things. But it's really going to come from other companies. It's going to be the sensible soft, uh, softwares. It's going to be the uh, Magic Bytes. It's going to be uh, companies that are really taking the unique features of home computers. Mouse control, larger memory, the ability to store to disk. Mm. And and the fact that you're not going to be sitting there for just five minutes playing, but you're going to be sitting there for 10 hours and playing, and they're going to run with it. So there's stuff coming. It's going to be awesome. I don't attribute it to this, but it. I think the magazine is already thinking in the right direction. Hmm. So, yeah, fun stuff. Hmm. <clears throat> and talk speaking about other of computer stuff? manufacturers... Computer game manufacturers. Sorry. Yes, Micropose opens Micropose. Sorry, Micropose opens development studio in the UK. Yes, Micropose, a company we have talked about a lot the last few months, is still reinventing itself in the face of the growing console market back on its home turf in the USA. Its wide range of complex DOS-based flight sims will now be ported to the Amiga and the Atari ST by the newly founded UK programming team as there are a lot more programmers familiar with those systems in Europe than in the US. Now, ultimately, this mm. studio would help develop such brilliant titles as the XCOM series, mm -hmm. uh, in addition to doing a lot of those ports. Yeah, I'm just wondering how a port of a complex DOS-based flight simulator would work on an uh, Amiga or another console. Uh, some of them worked somewhat, but you were really, because the Amiga and the ST, especially yeah. in their base versions. Now, we're not talking the Amiga 2000, for example, which was a machine okay. that had a lot of muscle, could do a lot, but did not have a extremely large user base at this point. Uh, most people who are going to be playing games are using an A500. Hmm. 
you're going to suffer in regard to frame rate. Now, even the DOS games at this point, we're not talking, you know, 60 frames a second. A really good game is running at 12 or 15, but an Amiga port of a MicroProse Flight Sim at this point can easily drop down to five or six frames per second. Really? <clears throat> oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yes. And so when you say this game takes hours and hours to be completed, you just mean getting from A to B, which A no, 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 no. You're, you're thinking like that the gameplay will slow down. The gameplay is still being processed <clears throat> in real time. It's just you're not getting an updated information in real time. This is even worse. Oh, of course. It made I mean, the games almost unplayable. I mean, then it's like... Oh, your game crashed. Oh, when did it happen? Oh, like in the frames we didn't show you. <clears throat> it, basically, yes. That, that kind of stuff would happen all Jesus. the time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, <clears throat> it was a compromise at the time because the 68000 processor for all of its wonderful attributes mm. just could not really push the polygons the way it needed to. And also, the problem is a lot of the game's could have run better had they been programmed from the ground up anew. Yeah. As opposed to trying <clears throat> to port existing code over to these systems. So did they gain any ground with those poorly made ports? Well, they did gain a little bit of ground in Europe because at this point in time, the European market is still very, very heavily <laughs> driven by these systems. I mean, a lot of people were still buying these games and the people who are looking for the more complex flight sims are probably more likely to buy than to pirate. Okay, so okay. if you're looking to play a quick little action game, you're probably more likely to pirate the game. If you're mm -hmm. looking for the game that's going to come with a 120 or 150 page manual on how to fly an F-19 or whatever then you you're going to buy the game. Okay. And this was a market that they needed to go for because remember, back in the U.S. at this point, they're trying to import a lot of action titles and arcade games from Europe for the Commodore 64 because that's the last platform in the U.S. that is still viable for that kind of software mm -hmm. because other, otherwise you've got to sell for the NES. And yes. Bill Steely is having a hell of a time trying to break into that market because number one, he's only allowed so many games a year. It's a whole new thing that he has to set up. He yeah. doesn't have a keyboard where he can lay out 50 different commands like he's used to. And mm -hmm. it's not that powerful of a system. It's basically a 6502. <clears throat> and so that is not an easy thing. I do believe there was an NES port of F-15 Strike Eagle. It may have even been... F-15 Strike Eagle 2. Uh, listeners can send me a correction on that. It wasn't what you would call a great gaming experience. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, they're flailing at this point and trying to find a new market. And they will find that new market. I mean, Civilization is right around the corner. Railroad oh, yeah, yeah, Tycoon sure. is right around the corner. And... Both of those games would get both ports to the Amiga and the Atari ST, and they would be very playable on those yeah. systems. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's round based so... I played the Amiga version of Civilization for an, such an ungodly number of hours that I've never actually gone to another <laughs> version of Civ. I tried playing Civ 2, and I was just burnt out. I literally must have <laughs> you logged... burned out. <laughs> I, I must have logged at least 100, maybe 150 hours on Civ. One... Yeah, I know. I, no, 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 I, I no. I'm addicted. not looking at you like like that. I, I mean, addicted. I've burned like the same amount of hours in Civ Five. Well, there you go. But so. for me, I, I had my Civ fix. Oh yeah. So I mean. this European, <laughs> without the Amiga and Atari ST versions, making a name for themselves on the U European market in the early '90s would mm. have been much, much more difficult. Okay. And they needed that experience. They needed that development. And let's face it, XCOM, that alone would have made, uh, or for European listeners, I would be remiss if I didn't call it by its original title, UFO Enemy Unknown, before it was relabeled XCOM for the U.S. release. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a move. Microprose is moving to survive, is evolving. <laughs> uh, they will survive for a while. 
uh, not forever, but for not. a while. And remember, uh, they're back. So they're back this year in the 2019. So there you go. And Bill Steely's back in it again. So hmm. uh, what comes around goes around, and you can't keep a good company down. Except maybe... Yeah, Our I, next I, I, story. Yeah, I, I know. I just don't know how to like pick up on that. <clears throat> how to trans? Uh, just, just read the headline. It's not that hard. I know. I can read the headline. It's just. It doesn't uh, really fit. Screw it. Right. Anyhow, um, Epix files for Chapter Eleven bankruptcy. Eleven years after its founding, in our first episode, Epix is going the way of the dodo. While the company would emerge from bankruptcy and develop a few more titles for the Lynx, they were just a shadow of their former selves and dissolved by 1993. So yes, the company that gave us the Dungeon Quest series, Summer Games, California Games, Jumpman, one of my all-time classics. Jumpman. Jumpman. Simple name, amazing game. Okay. Wow, that hadn't been rhymed and it was not planned. No, seriously, if you've never played Jumpman, I, I no. can't recommend it highly so enough. Is it like a man that jumps? It is a man who jumps, uh, okay. but every level basically has a new rule set. Mm -hmm. And so figuring out what the rule set is while avoiding the flying bullets and the robots and the flying saucers and all the other weird stuff that gets sent at you... Uh, is it makes it an action puzzle game of okay. tremendous quality, and it's I believe a 1983 release. Well, sounds good. So figuring out what's going on in the <clears throat> levels is like the gravity's reversed or the uh, buttons are reversed. No, uh, for example, sometimes there's these bombs throughout the level, and you okay. pick those off, and it uses color very very appropriately. So it's a black background. The normal ground you can walk on are these green girders, and then there's purple uh, ladders. Okay. So it's nicely contrasting. <clears throat> and in most levels, you also have this little bullet that's fly uh, that's slowly moving across the screen. Okay. And you don't know ahead of time if the bullet is activated by a vertical lock-on with you or a horizontal lock-on with you. Okay. But once it has the lock-on, it'll start flying really fast towards you. So you have to try to jump out of the way. Now, for example, in some levels, there won't be the regular bullets, but there'll be these really thick bullets. Okay. And when the thick bullets hit you, and there's not just one or two flying around, but you'll get five or six of them flying around. Oh, yeah, to when they touch you, they don't kill you. They make you jump in a random direction. Oh, Lord. So you need to make sure that you are either avoiding them or in a position where no matter which direction you jump, you're not going to land on something you're not supposed to land on. Jesus. <clears throat> this sounds really stressful. Oh, I mean, it is. You know, it's just my it's own an business game. and it's everyone's an just shooting game. at you. Then there's another one on. where as you pick off the bombs, there's these yeah. three bats. And the bats, I think it's after the second bomb you pick up. No matter which bomb you pick up, if it's the second or third one, the first bat gets released. Then okay. a couple more later, the second bat gets released. <laughs> and what they'll do is they'll fly in one direction, and then you'll hear a sonar sound, and then they'll redirect in your direction. So and you then, have to get out of the way so they and fly you, into And then the basically nothing. time it so they're going in, in a direction that's not where you are. Oh, Lord. Uh, uh, things like that. Uh, then there's another one where the bullets are flying, the regular bullets, and each time you pick up one of the bombs you get a piece of a ladder. And then you have to run up a ladder that's in the middle of the screen to get to a couple of bombs that are at the very top of the screen. And you have to build this ladder. But of course, when you're running up this ladder, you're now exposed to the bullets. Sure. And of course, there's always a timer on all of this. Yeah, of course. <laughs> because it's not hard uh, enough course. already. <laughs> and the game is brilliant. Oh, it's, it's another one of those absolute classics. It's been remade a couple of times over the years. Uh, and yeah, it's Epics was a great company, but here this bankruptcy that was announced is supposedly for restructuring, so they can move over to being a console-only manufacturer, which is mm -hmm. what we talked about last month. But in reality, uh, the Tremiels basically screwed them. Yeah, took over the Lynx project, promised them money, never paid, mm -hmm. and now they're just 
slowly going down the drain. It's like a thing they do, <clears throat> those tremules. Uh, the tremules are, um, yes, uh, there's a certain level of rat bastardry um, mm -hmm. in the tremule gene pool, apparently. Mm. I which, recognize a pattern. Which keeps showing up again and again and again as you go through the history of who they dealt with. Uh, and we may hear about them again next month. Huh. But all the way back in 79. Well, call so, me <clears throat> Yeah. Okay. Now, next so story. So, with Epic's gone, Activision is a gaming company once again. After more than a year of flirting with productivity software, a flirtation that started with the creation of the Mediagenic Holding Company, reason has prevailed. Thank God. Activision. Yes, thank <laughs> God. Activision, the original third-party publisher, is refocusing on games. The Mediagenic name would be around for a few more years, but Activision, the game company, is back. So, what made them change their mind? Uh, very simple. They couldn't compete in that market. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's uh, not sure. that crazy. Because just a few years before this, the number one, or the industry standard for graphic software and sound software, yeah. came out of Electronic Arts. Yeah. Okay, Deluxe Paint. Deluxe, I believe it was Deluxe Sound, but I'm maybe getting that wrong. Anybody send me an email to correct me, but don't send me a, a hate mail on that one. Uh, those two programs basically revolutionized what you could do with a home computer in yeah. regards to sound and graphics. And those were just internal development tools to make games. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense because if you want to make the games, you've got to be able to manipulate the graphics. So why sure. not sell the tools? Uh, Penguin Software, who we also talked about last month, they also started out making graphics software and yeah. that got used for games. So the idea of a games company being able to create tools is a natural fit because when you're making a game, you're creating tools. Right. Now, the only problem is that at this point in the industry, you're starting to get companies that are simply dedicated to this. The Adobe's of the world. Mm -hmm. You've got Microsoft basically cornering the office software market. Even though WordPerfect is still a major player in 89, WordStar is still a player in 89, you're starting to get uh, specialists yeah. in this arena. And Activision is just coming into it too late. It probably didn't help that they also took over Infocom after their disastrous attempt to make database software. Uh, okay. And that went belly up. And so they've just decided, you know what? This is not what we do. This is not where our competence lies. And now they're refocusing on games. And guess what? They're still around today and they're hmm. not doing poorly. So, yeah, uh, sent them, they've come to their senses. Thank goodness. So, and talking about innovations in the computer space. Thanks for spoon feeding me. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Club Caribbean launches on QLink. Building off of their previous online venture Habitat, Lucasfilm Games has partnered with QLink to launch Club Caribbean. I believe it's called Caribbean, but it couldn't find a pronunciation anywhere. A graphical online community program that uses customizable avatars. Now, Club Caribbean is really just a pared-down version of Habitat, which ran from 1986 to 1988 and was never financially viable. Uh, <clears throat> now, for those out there who have never heard of Habitat before, there is a link in the show notes to both the wiki entry on this as well as neohabitat.org. Now, that is a website that is running the original Habitat software. So mm -hmm. you can actually, it's basically through a Commodore 64 emulator, you can play Habitat as it existed back then. You can create your character, you can walk around, you can interact with other people. Uh, it is not probably not something you want to want to do for a lengthier period of time, but it is a really, really amazing time machine style experience to something that even if you had heard about it back in the day, you probably never got to experience it because, well, not a lot of people had modems, not a lot of people had the cash to be able to keep the modem running and pay for the hours. 
but mm-hmm. it was the forerunner to your avatar based online experience mm-hmm. and it set a lot of things in motion that cannot be understated in their importance in the long term uh, and then the simplified version of it is taking the graphical assets and just paring down a lot of the extraneous stuff that was probably just bogging down the servers and trying to make the whole experience easier and more comfortable for new users to grasp. Because the first one was kind of complicated just to figure out what the hell to do and why to do it mm. and all this stuff. It didn't really have proper rooms. It was more like a point and click adventure game. In fact, it looked almost identical to Lucasfilm's Labyrinth uh, game, the one uh, that was the adaptation of the Jim Henson movie. So, which is also an interesting experience in uh, early adventure gaming for anybody who hasn't tried it before. Hmm. Uh, now, do you know what Q Link was? Quantum Link. It was an online service no. provider. That if only shortly after this would change its name to America Online. Hmm. So Q-Link is the forerunner to America Online. Okay. Uh, and it was primarily a Commodore 64 <laughs> service at this point because, well, that was the dominant computer in homes. It made sense. Sure. <clears throat> yeah. Sure. Now, uh, one last little thing. The simplified version, so Club Caribou, would later be licensed out to Fujitsu for launch in Japan. And uh, I tried to find some more information on where that went afterwards. Mm -hmm. Uh, I found some indication that it actually got, that it spawned a sequel system uh, that was really huge in Asia, but I couldn't get any confirmation uh, for, uh, for the show on that. So anybody who has information on that, please send it to us. We will gladly add it to the show notes. And I mean, it's a yeah. really interesting story. Do you have any numbers whether or not this thing was uh, financially viable, the Club Caribbean? Uh, no, uh, none whatsoever. Uh, I'm guessing probably not. Or if it was, it was only just barely because mm. it would have been <laughs> Commodore 64 software and the C64 is dying at this point, and I didn't find any indication that it got ported to a DOS-compatible structure. Mm. So it's a fun little thing that they're recycling it here, but I don't think that it actually does a whole heck of a lot. I mean, but it's definitely foreshadowing the need to have a massive online multiplayer game, however this looks like. Mm, Exactly, and I mean, there were multiplayer online games, MUDs, Mm -hmm. multi-user dungeon systems, Uh, but the idea of having it as a fully graphical interface with customizable avatars and and the ability to talk with one another in real time, that really does, it it, it is a forerunner, but what the game was lacking, and it's not really a game in that sense, what Habitat was lacking was goals, quests, a reason to be there other than, oh, isn't this cool that I'm moving a character around and talking to somebody at the same time? I mean, it's basically a forerunner of, what's it called, Second Life? I I think In in many ways, you could say it's a forerunner of Second Life. Uh, It had some fantastical elements, but they were limited. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, there were like alien heads that you could buy, and you could change out the head of your character and walk around without a head if you wanted. But Mm -hmm. uh, you were right... In many, many ways, it is Second Life version uh, 0.5 mm-hmm. or something. It's a very forerunner of that experience. Just they're doing it on technology that's not ready for it yet. It's just right. too early. And also, I think it's funny that with the entire discussion about video games, violence, video games, dumbing down people and stuff, I, I, I'm really just... I'm astonished that this didn't bring up any discussion about video games stealing away your real life and putting you into a virtual <laughs> life. You, you know, you know what I mean. I know it. Maybe you mean. too early. Uh, you're thinking more of mazes and monsters, and that's going to be ten years earlier. 
and again a preview for next month. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be uh, seeing some implications from that. But uh, yes, for anybody who doesn't know Mazes and Monsters, a classic early 80s movie, and I believe the film debut, at least on television film debut, of Tom Hanks as a young man, uh, who mm-hmm. plays a uh, slightly mentally, cha- uh, not mentally challenged, but a uh, mentally troubled young man who gets into a D&D campaign, well, they call it Mazes and Monsters, and ends up <laughs> going... licensing purposes. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and ends up not being able to tell a reality from fiction and almost <laughs> dies and blah, 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 blah. It was based off of a novel at the time, mm-hmm. a pure fiction novel, but that started the D&D scare of the early 80s. D&D scare. Bum, oh, bum, yeah. Bah. Oh, no, it was huge. <laughs> yeah, your kid is going to become a Satanist, is going to start performing actual magic because if... Yeah, I guess you, of course. If you're... Okay, <laughs> uh, screw it, political correctness. If you're an idiot Baptist, you believe that shit's real. Oh, guess what? Well... It's not. Geez. Well, oh, Jesus. if I believed this stuff was real, I would immediately force my kid to play D&D. <laughs> Where's the spell where you can make gold coins, Billy? Tell me the spell for making gold coins. Exactly. But, Daddy, I have to sell part of my soul to the devil. Good! (laughs) Okay, yeah, enough of that. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, so... um, Yeah, so that was a thing. Uh, Like I said, it's a little bit of a foreshadow of what's going to happen. We're getting some of that next month, so... Woohoo! Uh, yes, um, yeah, fun stuff. but this month we get a new Atari hardware launch. A new month, a new launch. Atari sees the writing on the wall, and the days of standalone proprietary home computer systems are numbered. The Atari ABC286 is a standard PC compatible that should sell for £600 UK sterling in its base configuration. While internally virtually identical to Atari's PC4, just with a new outer shell, it would be the last IBM compatible that Atari would develop in-house. It would cease production in 1991. So, again, Atari is just basically shotgun approaching their hardware strategy at this point. Yeah. We've got the Lynx, we've got the 7800, the 5200, the 2600... Uh, the ST, the STE, the Falcon, and multiple IBM compatibles all coming out at the same time. To say nothing also of their two portable computers that are all... And virtually none of these systems are compatible with one another. You know, I think the management read a book about diversification, but they did not really get to the point where it states that diversification means doing different things and not the same over and over, <laughs> over and again. again. Yeah, it's it, it's it's a sad fact that at this point Atari is. I wouldn't say free fall, uh, but they obviously don't know how to save themselves, or at least aren't willing to say this is the horse we're betting on. Yeah. They're not willing to just say, you know what? We're just doing this one thing. This is our future. Instead, they're hoping to throw enough stuff out there and that the name alone will carry them. And, well, this is a preview for when we get to 1993. Uh, we're really going to see this. And at that point, we will have to delve into their annual reports because yeah. the 93 and 94 annual reports are... A thing of wonder but uh so stick around for the <clears throat> next four years exactly. or come back in exactly. four years exactly <laughs> whichever whichever you prefer but we prefer if you kept listening all these years oh sure uh and <laughs> they just can't seem to decide and when they finally do make that decision they will have lost so much money and they will not have a cash cow to fall back on anymore yeah which in this case really would have been the atari st they uh, should have used it as their backstop while they made a strategy and decided, okay, this is our future, this is what we're going for, and go whole hog on that. Instead, they keep this process going for a few more years. They dwindle down their reserves, and by the time they finally say, okay, we're out of computers, 
we're out of handhelds and we're and out of everything money everything <laughs> goes onto one system they don't really have yeah. the cash reserves left and they've also burned all their bridges with retailers who kept stocking all this stuff that they came out with so so many retailers end up with stuff that they don't know what to do with because Atari will launch it and then not support it because they've got something else coming down the pipeline. Yeah. Oh, well. It's kind of sad to see the way uh, Atari goes, but guess what? Yeah. It's not... We're it's not, not done over. yet with the bad news for Atari. No. The link stalls. Atari announces a limited holiday season launch for their Lynx handheld. Only New York and LA will get the color gaming machine this Christmas. I'm sure they'll have plenty of time to catch up to Nintendo, though. So, going into the 89 Christmas season, Nintendo's going to be nationwide, and Atari's going to be in New York and LA. in New York and LA. Can you imagine the mass of people just driving to New York or LA, depending on where you live, to get your, <laughs> to hands get on your links? links? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it's basically this is going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Mm. Uh, if they ever stood a chance of competing with Nintendo, mm -mm. they this was the Christmas to do it. They had yeah. to be on all the shelves in December of 89. And they they just don't have the product. They just don't have enough product created at this point. They don't have enough manufacturing capacity. They don't have the marketing budget. It's just not there. And they will never recover. The Lynx will never recover from this. Yeah. Sadly. And it was a great system by some amazing designers. And it had so much potential. And yet uh, they squandered it on, yeah, just not getting it out fast enough and getting the support that they needed. But c'est la vie. And talking about marketing failures. Yes, Sega parts ways with Tonka. After a less than stellar managing of the master system in the United States, Tonka has lost the rights to distribute Sega's 8-bit system in the U.S. Sega has taken all of their home console business for North America in-house and moved it to its San Francisco area headquarters. Now, hmm. already a couple months ago, we talked about how Virgin uh, Interactive, or Virgin Games, I believe at the time, got the exclusive European rights to the Sega line. Yeah. Uh, and here, it's Sega basically, again, uh, changing its strategies for North America. The Master System never really stood a chance in the U.S., never had any major penetration. Uh, we talked... Uh, almost a year ago about how they had finally allowed third parties to uh, develop titles uh, for the system. Mm -hmm. And that was at a time when the Genesis was already out in Japan, the Mega Drive. And so, yeah, Tonka dropped the ball. Tonka was not the right partner for this. They knew how to sell toy uh, trucks, but this was one step too far for them. And so Sega is going to take it on themselves, and they're going to be a little bit more aggressive than Tonka was. With the so why is that? What did they do? Oh well, we're going to get to those ads soon, but the uh, the Sega does what Nintendo don't. Ah, ads this ad campaign are are pr I believe at this point already hitting the U.S. <laughs> going broke in a big way. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, Sega did an amazing job of appealing to the slightly older audience. Yep. Uh, they paid a lot of money for celebrity endorsements, everything from Tony Lasorda, famous uh, baseball coach and manager, uh, coach or manager. I Somebody's going to have to correct me on that. I cannot remember. Baseball. Uh, but baseball. Uh, they had the uh, heavyweight champion of the world, Evander Holyfield, who was literally champion of the world for like a month uh, until Mike Tyson got the title back but he endorsed a game uh, there was uh, Michael Jackson endorsed a game Joe Montana the biggest football star in the world at the time endorsed a game so they literally had these big pe uh, big names showing up in the ads 
uh, showing the big graphics and the slogan, Sega does what Nintendo don't, hmm. was this I idea of actually. we're doing stuff <laughs> that's adult, we're doing 16-bit, and Nintendo is just still giving you 8-bit, and uh, come out and play and play with the big boys. And so that licensing really helped. And later on, they got even more aggressive with the Sega Yell ads. Mm. Uh, but those are still, I believe, two years away. And those are going to come out as a way to attack the Super Nintendo and help promote Sonic. Okay. But Sonic is also still out in the, in the ether. Mm. Sonic isn't here yet. But hmm. approaching past. <laughs> yes. And now speaking of the console wars heating up. Yes. Konix, Mrs. Xmas, and payments. Co the Konix multi system has been delayed past Christmas, and rumors abound of bounce checks, unpaid contractors, and employees, as well as a six week halt on all software development, as there still is no final hardware spec to work off of. Those involved are still confident it will appear at some point, though. And, yeah, the Connex Multisystem. For those uh, joining us late, Connex was a UK-based uh, peripheral maker, mainly yep. joysticks and other things uh, for the uh, big supplier for the Spectrum, Sinclair Spectrum system. And they've been promoting this super-duper... It will do anything and everything console that we have yet to actually see any real screenshots of other than ports of 8 and 16-bit home computer titles that aren't really impressing anybody at this point. Hammer Fist, which was a fairly pretty looking game, but didn't really do much. It didn't have scrolling or anything. Um, it's basically going to be a bit of a problem. And the big thing that they were going to sell it with was a chair that moved and you could change it to a steering wheel or change it to a joy pad or change it to a flight stick. And well, yeah, the fact that it was supposed to come out for Christmas and they don't even have a full set of hardware specs, it, the thing is vaporware. Yeah. And it will simply disappear. Hmm. But... We're not writing it off just yet because we can probably still milk a couple of stories out of it. Right. So it'll come out and it'll be fantastic. Yes. And that promise of being fantastic extended to? The wither. Wizard. Wizard. Yeah. I, 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 I felt my, my tongue went somewhere I didn't and, want yeah. it to go to. Yeah, no problem. Anywho, uh, the wizard hits theaters. If there's an argument to be made that after-school cartoons in the 1980s were a little more than 30-minute toy commercials, then welcome to the big leagues because Nintendo wants you to pay to watch a 90-minute infomercial for the NES. And they get the hype train going with a four-page ad in GamePro magazine, followed by a two-page ad for the Power Glove. Well, that fits perfectly. It's so bad. Oh, yes. So, <laughs> have you ever seen The Wizard? No, I have not, actually. You haven't seen no, The Wizard? Oh, you know what? This this might actually be something for, like, a live stream at some point. The two of us sitting down to watch The Wizard. Okay. It is... Oh, it's so bad. Uh, sorry, that's a so line from you the movie. Want... It, it's, it's terrible on a level... Of awesomeness, at least? No, no, no. It's, no, just, it's just bad. It, okay. The, the plot is mm. mostly nonsensical. The whole thing is just a commercial for the NES. And the main reason to watch it back in the day was that the final 10, 15 minutes mm -hmm. was a big competition. And it was the first site in North America or the first way in North America to see footage of Super Mario Brothers 3. Awesome. Ah. So they actually put in a preview for the hot game at the end of this movie mm -hmm. to hype everybody up about playing Super Mario Brothers 3. Okay. Which had Makes already sense. been out in Japan for quite a while, but this is the days before the internet where you could get away with selling a two-year-old game and making people believe that, ooh, this is the hot, new hotness. Stuff. 
Yeah. Huh. And, okay. uh, yeah, I don't know how yeah. much money it made at the box office. I didn't bother to check. It was not a huge success. But I'm sure it moved some uh, hardware and some software. After consulting the magic of the internet, ba 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 ba. Yes, The Wizard made $14 million in 1989, making it the 17th highest grossing film of the year, according to BoxOfficeMojo.com. Actually, not too bad for a full-length advertisement. Uh, Not bad at all. I mean, now, uh, granted, there's a whole bunch of movies. Back in 89, you were still releasing a lot of top, top films right around Christmas. So there's a few movies that would probably have pushed it down a little bit including Born on the Fourth of July, Driving Miss Daisy, and a few others. But for our purposes, we're going to go with number 17 that year. And 89 was one of the biggest blockbuster years of all time. We got Batman, Indiana Jones, The Last Crusade, Ghostbusters 2, Back to the Future 2, Twins, Christmas Vacation. I mean, The Little Mermaid. It is a bonanza year Hmm. for uh, film. So it, it, it actually does really, really well, all things considered. Hmm. And uh, for being an hour and a half long Nintendo commercial, not too shabby. Not too shabby. It was a good year for Nintendo. It was a very good year for Nintendo, and you yeah. almost said that as if you were setting up the next story. Yes, I was. What other wonderful things happened to Nintendo? Yeah, Nintendo beats Atari in Tetris fight. The June ruling in the fight over Tetris rights has come to a very swift end. On November 13th, a federal judge ruled that Nintendo had all the home console rights of the game as part of a summary judgment ruling, canceling the planned trial. She said Atari had no factual matters to prove. Ooh. Yes. Destroyed. (laughs) Now, the lawyer in me is saying, oh boy, (laughs) because... The only time you would get a judge to give you this is if your original complaint stated absolutely no grounds, even in the best of circumstances, that would lead to you winning the case. Hmm. It's basically saying from the get-go, you're claiming something that is impossible for you to ever prove. And you're wasting my time. Yeah. So get the hell out of here. And, well, we've talked about this before when this fight started a few months ago when we reported on it. Yep. Uh, and this isn't the only fight between Atari and Nintendo that is currently running through the courts. Uh, but in this one, it really is an issue that Nintendo's, uh, Atari, sorry, Atari's rights to Tetris were based off the Mirror Group's rights. And Mirror Group was Maxwell, uh, the Maxwell Group, which we talked about also last month, yep. which is a house of cards that's falling apart. And it was a set of rights that Maxwell had purchased from the Soviet government through an intermediary. And the original language of that contract did not specify computers and all sorts of other stuff. And this was a time when the Soviets didn't really or were perceived as not understanding what the hell they were doing. And the person doing the business dealings was uh, less than sophisticated or wasn't paying attention close enough, didn't think that it wouldn't be a problem if he half-assed it because you mm. could always fix it later and unfortunately he the couldn't. soviets <laughs> uh got him to sign away all but the computer rights and then immediately signed a deal with nintendo giving them the console rights so the atari position that computer meant anything with a microprocessor <laughs> basically disappears and so all of uh, all of Atari, through their console division Tengen's uh, copies of Tetris, had to be basically destroyed and taken off the market. And Ooh. even though many people claim the Tengen version of Tetris was a better version of Tetris than what Nintendo actually put out on the NES. 
Hmm. But then again, nobody really remembers either one of those versions because the Game Boy version of Tetris is the one that really brings the bacon home. It brings all the boys to the yard, basically. Bring home the bacon. You don't know that phrase? No. It's basically, it means that you're the one providing for the family. You're earning the money that keeps things going is to bring home the bacon. It's just funny. I mean, in Germany, it's like you bring home the bread. And then the American saying is bringing home the bacon. We need more grease. Exactly. (laughs) Hey, come on. Are you really going to compare the quality of providing for a family by bread? Or are you going to do it by Greasy, smoked, cured pork flesh. Well, that depends on your definition of a healthy living. So uh, let just hey, let's hey, just hey, say hey. let us open. You know, <laughs> let the okay, audience decide. So it's it's a common phrase. So I've already ticked off the, the Baptists in the audience. I do not want to get rid of the vegans at this point. So. You can have all of the fake bacon you want. I, yeah, there's I'm so cool many vegans that. listening to us. I, I'm sure. Uh, why not? Why wouldn't there be? I mean, I that's really not that uncommon nowadays. Vegetarians or vegans? Yeah, it's not that uncommon. It wouldn't wouldn't surprise me one bit. Well, Just because you and I aren't part of that community does not mean that we do not share a common bond in the world of video game trivia and. Human ship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Human ship, human ship. It's about <laughs> video games, okay? Okay, All good. Right. So I believe that that concludes our journey to December of 1989. Let's turn on the time machine and head out to December of 1999. Ba 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 boom, ba boom. Okay, no, sorry, that doesn't really work as a time jump sound no 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 no. okay good so welcome to december of 1999 and in the break i did (laughs) suggest the following any vegan listeners out there send us an email so peter realizes that we do actually have vegan listeners Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, and by the way, I want to say I'm sorry. Um, Carl just pointed out to me I'm insulting a whole lot of people. <laughs> yes. Yes, you are. It's okay. Yeah. Now. Well, it's okay. Good. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's okay. 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 Moving on. I'm trying not to insult anyone. It's hard nowadays. It's really hard. Um, and this friend in the- <laughs> This isn't helping. Okay. <laughs> this is not helping at all. Anyhow, Y2K is upon us. Fire and brimstone coming down from the skies. Rivers and seas boiling. Forty years of darkness. Earthquakes. Volcanoes. The dead rising from the grave. Human sacrifice. Dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. Is there any content hidden in this? <laughs> oh, you don't recognize this? No, I'm... This is a quote from Ghostbusters. When they're explaining ah, okay. to the mayor what's going to happen if Gozer uh, gets the uh, gets its way and destroys the city and so forth. Ah, yeah. So I I just took the quote. I thought it would be a cool From way a to movie explain that Y2K. came out like fifteen years prior to Y two K. Uh, sixteen years. Yes. Huh. 1983. But come on, it's Ghostbusters. It's Ghostbusters. Yeah, That's it's, true. You, you can't go wrong with Ghostbusters. So, Y2K, it's here. It's bad. Shit's going to get real. Yes, all the computer systems are going to crash. Uh, it, you know what? Not all of them, but given how much work actually went into fixing everything, it's one of those situations where it's very, very hard not to argue that had they not done all of that, something bad would not have happened. I mean, who could have seen that when creating those machines, eventually there will be a Y2K, you know? Uh, the problem was when they created them, there was no option. You had to save space. Yeah. And number two, nobody expected that software to survive as long as it did. Nobody expected those systems not to be upgraded. <laughs> The power of engineering. (laughs) Uh, The power of engineering, but also just the fact that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Oh, that's true. And ultimately, I mean, come on, you're a bean counter. No matter how you want (laughs) to, how you want to roll it, your management 
do you fix things just because there's something new out there or do you only fix things when they don't work anymore well i get new things every once in a while because fixing them is more expensive than getting new but stuff. that means they weren't working anymore well or yeah <laughs> if they're still working you ain't fixing them or if they hinder production to an extent that makes getting a new well that's thing not doing reasonable. their job anymore yeah. yeah but as long as everything keeps working nobody's going to change anything Right, and that true. is basically what happened here. Nobody expected these systems to still be running that that deep into the game. And fixing it just costs a lot of money. I mean, we heard it from quarter past. Yeah. Uh, this wasn't. Uh, this was pre our special episode. And remember, if you haven't listened to the special FCC episode yet, you should go back and do that because absolutely amazing stuff. Oh yeah, this guy knows his stuff. Yeah. Uh, but that was what he's he used to or still does i'm guessing a program COBOL, and he made a killing during y2k fixing those old systems and so this is why having somebody like him and again this is a good credential for him he knows the systems of the day and that gives him a very special insight into the importance of the fcc reforms of 79 yeah. So, okay, but Y2K, it's here. Let's get on to some bigger, higher tech, cool stuff. <laughs> the chain of a millennia. <laughs> All right, let's get to something cool. Um, 3DFX CEO Gregory Ballard steps down. Ballard ends his three-year tenure as CEO of the 3D Accelerator board manufacturer because the company needs a fresh perspective. That's a quote. While Ballard saw the company rise to become the number one seller of 3D accelerators at retail, they are now falling way behind in OEM sales and the stock price is well below where it was at the IPO. Well, this is a new <laughs> this is new for every IPO. The stock price is below the IPO. Rate. Well, it's it's not new, <laughs> but it, it, here it is way below the IPO. Right. And it did not come out necessarily at a time when this kind of IPO would have really been that big of a deal. But Ballard, at, and this is important, do you know what the OEM mar market is? You will surely explain this to our dear listeners. Exactly. OEM is what you call, and I'm going to kill the uh, abbreviation, the original equipment manufacturer. And OEM is basically when a part... Is, pur is purchased not by the end customer trying to repair a computer, for example, or build their own, but it's purchased by a large-scale manufacturer like the Dells of the world yeah. uh, and even smaller-scale manufacturers they are building locally or something. So OEM sales, they don't make as much money on a per-unit basis. So if you're going into a computer store to buy the card, you're going to be paying more than the manufacturer does when they buy 20 or 100 sure. or 1,000 of them. But by losing out on the OEM sales, especially at this time when more and more people are buying pre-made computers and not building them themselves, this is also around the same time that the famous, oh, uh, hey, dude, you're going to get a Dell or something like that ad campaign mm -hmm. was going on in the U.S. This really annoying kid is telling uh, other teenagers, oh man, you're going to get a Dell, this is so cool, or blah, blah, blah. The fact that <laughs> the 3D FX accelerator cards are not being built into these PCs hmm. means that they're just not getting the mass of users that they used to have, right. and that critical mass is going to basically spell doom for the Voodoo API, which was right. the API standard 3D effects was used. I mean, no one will develop software for your stuff anymore. Exactly. Now, Ballard would go on to have many other important positions in the industry, including a six-year stint as CEO of Glue Mobile, the very successful mobile gaming company. Never heard of them. Oh, honestly. Glue was basically one of the first major movers and shakers in yeah. the mobile gaming uh, okay. arena they they were huge i mean they're still huge today and speaking of software publishers well first i want to take back i totally know uh, what i said i totally know glue i just forgot that i know them 
Okay, Noah yeah. looking at the games of them. Just, yeah, geez. wait, you have to tell everybody. We we just took a little pause and, yeah, and just, looked up Glue I because... I didn't have the name in my yeah, brain. Diner Dash. Uh, and for those in the know, the super geeky Transformers Generation 1 Awakening. Absolutely amazing, even though it's very, very short, turn-based strategy game using the original Transformers. Hmm. Phenomenal t- a title. And for the less geeky amongst you, the Kim Kardashian Hollywood game also was made by Glue. <sighs> yes, and it made way too much money. <laughs> way too More much. More than it deserved. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. But speaking of yeah, game speaking publishers. Speaking of game publishers, the French game publisher stock market money spree continues. What a title. What a title. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I put my soul into these things when I write them. Yeah, I see. The exclamation uh, mark shows it. Oh, yes, yes. There's an exclamation <laughs> mark at the end. So, this time, Titus, makers of the infamous Superman on the N64 and Dick Tracy on the C64, have just bought up UK publisher Virgin Interactive, giving them not only strong distribution networks in the UK, Germany, and Spain, but also a controlling share of US game maker Interplay. So, we've talked about this over the last few months a lot. Infogram probably being the best example of a French company driven by the stock boom in France. Titus, a company that's been around for forever in the European scene uh, with virtually nothing to show for it as far as high quality games, unfortunately. But they've got enough cash now to not only sink Superman, (laughs) but (laughs) to also now purchase Virgin Interactive. Wow. And this does give them a massive way uh, set up for selling games and the controlling stake in Interplay, the company known for big RPGs in the States. But unfortunately, we've talked about Interplay last mm. couple months as well. Interplay is not doing well. They've been trying to sell off movie rights and the like uh, just to get some cash. Well, the hope at this point really is that Titus is going to bring in enough money yeah, to keep them afloat keep them afloat so they can regroup and make even <clears throat> more great RPGs and other games. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, let's leave this open. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and I do mention of the many, many really terrible games that Titus made over the years, and I could have chosen any number of them, be it Night Force or some of the crazy car games, but I decided to go with Dick Tracy on the C64 because it is truly even worse than Superman 64. <laughs> and believe me when I say that, because at least Superman 64 is a completable game. <laughs> Dick Tracy on the C64 is not even a finished game. It's like they, it, there's a whole it's history behind beta. it that is absolutely <laughs> ludicrous. Uh, and if I find an article, I'll try to put a link down in the show notes, so check that out. Okay, and speaking of companies uh, buying, up, buying companies. up other companies. Yes, Barnes & Noble buy uh, buys Babbage's. Up. Buys up Bab- 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 Babbage's. Bab- 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 Babbage. <laughs> Ba 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 And copyright. Yeah, no, okay. okay. No, it's okay. There's no copyright infringement going on on your side. <laughs> no, no, none whatsoever. <laughs> Barnes and Noble buys up Babbage's, Babbage's etc. Et Thanks. You're welcome. Glad to be of service. Yeah. So, <laughs> book selling Behemoth. Barnes and Noble has purchased Babbage's etc. The company that emerged from the merger of Software Etc. and Babbage's, two North American software retail chains. At the time of the purchase, Babbage's Etc. was owned by Leonard Riggio, who was also the principal shareholder and CEO of Barnes & Noble. Hmm. Barnes & Noble would later spin the company off again after merging it with a few smaller software retailers it acquired into the behemoth known today as GameStop. So, uh, first off, do you know who Babbage was? No, I just like the fact that Babbage's and Software Etc. merged, and the only thing that <laughs> from Software Etc. that was kept alive was the Etc. Et 
Well, okay. That's nice. uh, I, now, so Babbage is a famous English mathematician, yeah. and he developed what many consider to be the first fully functional computer. Yeah. Even though in his lifetime, he wasn't able to actually build it because the components were too... Uh, he couldn't get the components exact enough. Okay. Uh, and his assistant, uh, or some would say co-designer... You Ada mean Ada Lovelace. Lovelace? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Ada Lovelace. Thank you. You're welcome. And, <laughs> and Ada Lovelace uh, and Babbage, she be basically is the person who first starts programming a computer he's building the first programmable computer and uh yeah so they named this software store after babbage uh and software etc was another software retail chain that was actually the one that i had the most familiarity with uh mm -hmm. living in seattle if for those in the seattle area the software etc at uh, Bellevue Square Mall and the Software Etc. at South Center Mall. Those were the, my two go-to places. And if you're also of a certain vintage down around South Center, we also had another little shop that sold uh, Mega stuff. And there was also Bruno's Software something or other, Software Warehouse, I think, uh, which is a big software discounter. They always had old Apple stuff and things in the mm -hmm. back. It, it, distributed around the hall so yeah good memories of going into those stores and uh, buying stuff but yeah by the time barnes and noble takes them over they started relabeling some of the stores hmm. and then finally a few years later gamestop emerges out of all this but it's yeah it's the software stores are becoming more behemoth like uh even though the largest retailer for software is still Walmart at this juncture. Yes. So, okay. And talking about uh, behemoths. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably the word of the day for this episode. Most I've likely. used it like five times, I think. Mm -hmm. Pokemon, the OG loot box. The massive Pokemon trading card fad has finally triggered a lawsuit. A class action suit has been filed claiming that the distribution of the cards and their unequal values constitute a form of gambling, no different from scratch-off lottery tickets. This would be a form of illegal gambling and a violation of the RICO, Racketeer Influence and Corrupt Organizations laws. Huh. So, do you remember the Pokemon trading card fad? Oh, sh fad? Fad. I, I don't know. A fad word. means that uh, it's it's a hugely, hugely popular thing for a very short period of time, and then it dies out. A short period of time, dude. You're basically defining a whole chunk of my child. Well, yeah, okay, a uh, short period. Of time. <laughs> yes, of course, of course. Um, I just don't really see where the. I mean, yes, the different values on par with that, um, but the. I mean. In a lottery, yeah, you put in money and you hope to get out some more money. Yes. And there, you hope to get out some Pokemon. So, and they equal basically Pokemon and money, which well, you can get the out. The argument, as far as I understood, and I didn't look at any of the original court documents, yeah. but from the reporting, the argument is that because these cards are so valuable and there is a fairly active trading uh, society or culture around these cards where people are publishing books telling you what each card is worth, where people are selling them online for large amounts yeah. of money. They're saying that the easy, easy transaction of the cards mm -hmm. makes them equivalent to money. Well, isn't that true for anything that is co uh, collectible? Well, and this and not is, huge. <laughs> and this is true, and this is also the reason why this case fails miserably in the courts. Okay. Because it is no different from any other collectible card, be it a baseball card, which is the classic in the United States that most of these things are modeled after. Uh, you know, you buy a pack of cards. You don't know who's going to be popular. You don't know which one's going to be valuable. Right. 
Uh, but there, you don't know which one's going to be valuable because you don't know what the careers of these people will look like in the future. Well, but this is basically the same, right? No, because here, because you're battling with the cards, yeah. the creator of the card is determining how powerful the card is and thus determining how valuable the card is. Well, the creator of the, <laughs> the baseball player is basically determining how well, uh, this guy is. I mean, well, let's face just... it. If, if you get a Ken Griffey, famous yeah. baseball player, you get Ken Griffey Jr.'s rookie card, at the beginning of his career, yeah, you have no idea if he's going to be successful or not. Exactly. And you have no idea if he's going to get injured or not. And he has no control over that. Sure. He could lose out and be gone. And then his card is worthless. Right. Now, the difference here is that on the Pokemon card, they're putting in the values. And if they make one card that's super powerful and make it super rare... Yeah. In theory, you could calculate, based on what is happening in the market, how valuable that card is going to be on the secondary market, even before you've put it in the first packet. Right, okay. And because they have control over that value, they're arguing that it's different from a sports card collectible. Because they're yes. the ones determining the value of the card with no outside force. Okay changing that valuation and in that regard i think there is some merit to this argument i don't think that it's a great argument i don't think it would fall under the rico laws which were actually designed to stop the mob the mob the, uh, mm -hmm. the mafia <clears throat> but put the right way i do think that this argument could have had some legs and it could have actually limited some of the actions of companies like Wizards of the Coast, who were the producers mm -hmm. of the Pokemon cards. But ultimately, the way this turns out, the case gets dismissed. There's no grounds for it. And the collectible trading card uh, industry continues. The uh, And not, sorry, not con tradable uh, collectible cards, but the battling card system games continue to this day yeah, i can't remember anyone who ever battled with those cards this was just for the sake really? of having them yeah really at least oh wow yeah really. yeah no i remember i used to hang out around this time i was studying i was finishing my bachelor's degree mm. and i remember hanging out at a bookstore on the weekends to study okay i was not into the super geek stuff back then and, and little kids i mean it was the seven eight nine ten year olds they would flood this bookstore this one of these really? big box bookstores okay and there'd be dozens and dozens of them everywhere littered all over the floor buying uh, uh, trading and playing pokemon cards it was crazy it was just mm. nuts and uh, this whole thing gets started from two mothers whose kids basically blew like thousands of dollars on these cards. <laughs> and number one, why does your kid have thousands of dollars to blow on cards? Right. And number two, why did you let them blow thousands of dollars on cards? What the hell is going on? Society is responsible, Carl. Society is responsible for them just being bad mothers. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's an episode of insulting other people we don't, don't know jack about. I'm about to become a parent, dude. This is going to be so bad once I start making these mistakes and I want to find somebody else to blame. <laughs> oh, man. It's going to suck. <laughs> I don't want to lose this wonderful little way of ranting at other people for being crap. Oh, life sucks. Well, okay. but then you can say, well, I suck, but at least I don't suck as much as they, they do. do. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Okay, Moving now, on. talking about society is responsible. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Arcade games get rated. Rated or rated? <laughs> <laughs> the rate gets rated. 
Okay, they get rated. The link between mass shootings and gaming has now led to a voluntary labeling of arcade machines. The color-coded rating system is designed to designate which arcade cabs are more or less suitable for younger viewers. Now, it was about six months ago we did a story about this where the arcades in Florida had started to voluntarily label. Yeah. Well, this is now a nationwide labeling system that the mm -hmm. industry has ag <clears throat> agreed to, similar to what, for example, you would have seen with movies with the MPAA. Okay. So... But this labeling was voluntarily for, for uh, voluntary for the uh, arcade um, industry. Industry, yes. Yes. So remember, there's we we have at this point a labeling system for home games, be yeah. it computer and console, but that didn't apply to the arcade industry at this point. So as a twelve year old kid, you can go in there and play Mortal Kombat. Bingo. There's okay. no restrictions in the U.S. on that. Uh, and there wasn't even any labeling. Now, it didn't make a lot of sense to label them because they're large cabinets with the screens running. Well, so when you walked in, you could see it. And well, you can they have weren't a, segregated. A, a, starting from 18 section. Now. I mean, you would kill off your business. But. You would kill off your business, and nobody was about to do that because the first, uh, the arcade I used to visit the most. Uh, down in Florida at this time, the first thing you saw when you walked through mm -hmm. the door was a House of the Dead 2 cabinet this with a so giant much. screen and the guns. And then they replaced that mm -hmm. a little while later with a Gunblade New York game, which if you've never played Gunblade New York, there is a Wii port. It's okay. But you haven't really played it until you've gone to the arcade and you have this giant plastic gun. Literally, the thing is about, I'd say, almost a meter long. And it rumbled. If it's oh, working, Lord. you're you're supposed to be <clears throat> a gunner on a helicopter flying around New York City trying to stop a terrorist attack with hundreds of terrorists jumping out of cars and stuff. <laughs> and you are shooting, shooting out of the window of the side of this helicopter, which is the screen, at these guys. Okay. And every one of your shots, and this is a machine gun, so it's going... Da, 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 and each one of the shots is rocking your hand. I remember the game was still new, so all the parts were working properly. After playing it for about 10 minutes, my hand went numb. I couldn't <laughs> feel my hand from the vibration. Amazing experience. So Gunblade New York, if you find a fully working version, I don't care how many coins it is, you're popping those in and playing it, people, because it's still an amazing experience. So, but yes, uh, violence. It's, <laughs> it's what's for dinner. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah. And, and they also think I, I, they also had a time killer machine. So it, 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 the rating meant nothing. It was a little sticker in the top corner of the marquee on the cabinet, and mm -hmm. nobody paid attention. Right. So, but everybody was afraid of the hammer coming down, and you wanted to have it labeled because you wanted to, to have sure. it labeled. Just to be on the safe side, yeah. yeah. Just to be safe, I'm sure. And safe. speaking of arcades. Yes, Disney's quest to dominate arcades comes to an end. The Disney Quest chain of arcades has so <laughs> uh, has been one of many black eyes the megacorp has suffered in their amusement park side of the business under Bob Eisner. This attempt to bring Disney level production values to the arcade just hasn't caught on, and expansion plans have been killed. And yes, yeah, so Disney Quest was an attempt by Disney to get into the arcade business mm -hmm. with uh, uh, with stores, locations around the country. Yeah. Uh, and they were trying to bring basically like a mini version of Disney's high-tech attractions to the smaller local arcade locations. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the problem was it didn't really work for an arcade. So your virtual reality-esque type of experiences 
They were fun if you had to wait two hours in line at Disneyland and you went there maybe once every five years. So you could amortize the cost of this ride. You weren't going to get bored of it. Yeah. And the shock and awe effect would be there. But if you have an arcade in a city and people want to go to the arcade again and again and again, yeah. they're only going to use that ride once, twice, three times, and they're going to be bored with it. Right. They're going to want something with a longer experience than what Disney was normally used to providing in their amusement parks. Uh, and they wanted more variety, which meant that you had to lower the production cost of the individual rides to provide more content, which is what an arcade cabinet does. Yes. And so th this was never going to be a functional uh, and viable plan. And there's a great documentary. There's a YouTube channel called Defunct Land, which... Uh, they did a whole episode uh, on this, and I've included the link to that episode in the show notes. Hmm. So, yes. Disney's quest to go into the arcades, going nowhere. But games <laughs> may be going someplace Best else. Tales. Yes, games to movies is still a thing. So, Redneck Our... Rampage movie rights have been sold to Sony while ADV Films will release an anime film based on the game Sin. Now, Redneck Rampage the movie Wildly successful. didn't never materialize. <laughs> Sony never took it any place. Unfortunately, it would have been awesome. But the anime film based on the game Sin did get a release. Uh, and uh, I don't know if it made a lot of money or not, but I just remember seeing it on... Uh, video store shelves mm -hmm. and being like okay i don't care and moving on how can you not care i mean haven't you seen the mario movie uh, i i i i, I <laughs> have seen the mario movie See? i live tweeted the mario movie years ago when i watched it for the first time and yeah oh boy or was yeah. it at some point just oh boy oh boy i, I had to take a break in the middle <laughs> I, I literally <laughs> i have to could go puke. Not do it in one sitting <laughs> i didn't have to puke it was just it was just so painfully bad. So you needed some new keys to type. Oh boy, <laughs> you need a new keyboard. No, no, it was just it was terrible. That's another one yeah. we could live stream at some point. But uh, oh. yeah, so there's still oh, this yeah. attempt to take the storylines of games and move them into theaters. I mean, Tomb Raider's coming uh, at, at this point, and we will get a bunch of these attempts over the years oh, yeah. and th there's there's just a disconnect here unfortunately uh what counts as a great game or what works as a great storyline in a game mm -hmm. is not necessarily going to work in a two-hour movie format can you think of a video game that has been transformed into a successful and actually good movie mortal kombat one the first mortal kombat movie Way quicker than i thought is a perfect transition. Is it a spectacular movie with great plot and great... No. But the game wasn't a hugely plot-driven one either. It was about a whole bunch of colorful characters with an excuse to fight one another in amazing action sequences that were technically, for the time, surprisingly awesome on screen mm -hmm. with just enough humor to keep you going. Okay. And... It recreated all the things you wanted to see from the game. The scenes from the game, the moves of the characters, and that amazing techno soundtrack opening that's just loud as hell. And to watch that in a movie theater when the screen is black and then you see this flame burst up through the Mortal Kombat logo mm -hmm. and just hear the sound from the arcade game, Mortal Kombat. It was a... It was a blast, one of the best experiences I've had with friends in a, a movie theater. Mm. And so, yes, that was a very successful adaptation. Okay. And I would still argue that the movie Alcatraz, oh, mm -hmm. sorry, not Alcatraz, The Rock, was an unofficial adaptation mm -hmm. of the Infogrom game Alcatraz, because they have basically the same plot and the same storyline and everything else but mm -hmm. 
Alcatraz, very unknown game, a spiritual sequel to one of my favorites, Hostage. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, yeah, I like my little weird obscure games. So that, I believe, concludes our time trip this month. It does. It does. We're at the end. Jeez. Nothing else to say. It feels like We're done. it's just been five minutes, what has been two weeks. It, Man. It's, <laughs> well, not only that, it, it's been a few hours, okay? <laughs> We've been doing this for a little bit now. So, with that being said, uh, this also ends our jaunt through the 70s. Yes. We're done with the 70s. When we come back, there will be no disco music. Nope. There will be no bell bottoms. Nope. It's all going to be neon colored fabrics, perms, and. Just uh, overnight. Yeah, overnight. Everything vanishes. Hair from metal the 70s. ballads yeah. from Stroke of Midnight, Studio 54 is gone, and that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your wife said this joke is bad. <laughs> and I, I was arguing, arguing, you know, that it depends on the delivery and it might work. Did I it? have to admit. Your it wife worked? was kind of right. Oh man, you just hurt me. Like, hurt my feelings. Right yeah, now. but this this is the I'm, episode I'm go, where I'm hurting I'm every everyone. You know. In protest, I am going to put on a bright colored suit, refuse to wear socks, and move okay. and live on a boat together with an alligator. Oh yeah, right before your child. Uh, that, that's yes. that, that, yeah. that's what I'm gonna and do. There's because no connection between you becoming a father and the being 70s. We are done like with the seventies. <laughs> We're moving into the 2000s. I mean, it's great stuff. So, yeah. Okay. Everybody, uh, thanks for being here. Glad you, hope you enjoyed the show. And remember, everything we talked about, sources, extra links are in the show notes. Please check them out. Also, don't forget, subscribe to us on your favorite podcasting app, Subscribe to us on YouTube. Even if you're not watching it on YouTube, come on, subscribe. It'll be fun. And uh, is there any place else? Patreon. Patreon. Yes, yes. You always forget the most important one. Dude, we want to deliver surround sound. <laughs> Can you remember? <laughs> yes, we, we still do need a little bit of help with the uh, costs of hosting here. Yeah. So we'd appreciate any help you can give us. I mean, it, we got one buck a month and two buck a month uh, tiers. Uh, we also have higher ones, but yeah, we're happy with one or two bucks a month. And beyond that, uh, follow us on Twitter, Video Game News R2, because uh, we do a lot of posting there, discussions. You can hear wonderful little opinions about old games and blah, blah, blah. Right. And, and send us some emails. Send us email, yes. Anything you want to talk about, if we screwed something up, let us know, okay? Dude, we are so multi-channel. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. We also have a couple of corrections, or one major correction, and this was brought up by uh, the founder of History of How We Play. Uh, we'll add a link to uh, his amazing blog in the show notes. And he told me on Discord that I almost blew his mind when I mistakenly last month commented that Pac-Man, I couldn't remember which year Pac-Man came out, and I said it was either 81 or 82, and it, of course, Pac-Man was one of the famous 1980 games. I should have known that. I misspoke. And I deeply and profoundly apologize. No, sincerely, shouldn't have made that mistake. Yeah, you shouldn't. No, I shouldn't have. So, uh, I'm, I apologize. I'm sorry. Okay, other than that, I hope everybody had a good time. Any parting words? No, I'm just startled by you making so many mistakes and no seeing with the Pac-Man mistake, there was one more mistake. I don't, I don't know. Can you're, I you're trust losing you anymore? Trust in me. Can I trust you anymore, I, man? I am no longer the uh, man you look up to in such admiration. And we leave that open. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> With that being said, uh, have fun, everybody, and we will see you all next month. Bye.